Right. Thank you, Karen, and thanks again for all the participants joining this afternoon. My talk, I'm going to essentially lay out a broad overview of sustainability, agricultural production, and its implications uh, with big data. Um, of course, sustainability sometimes means different things to different market groups. And besides that, it's just a very large topic, so I'll really only have time today to talk about a few, a few of the highlights. So I'd encourage everyone uh, to go online to CFAIR's website and look at the report uh, for more details. So really just to, uh, to begin, smart irrigation systems use real-time data from networks of soil and weather sensors to automate irrigation. Uh, several precision irrigation tools are currently being developed and field tested while others have already been commercialized. So just to give you two quick examples, uh, some corn and soybean farmers in the Midwest are using variable rate irrigation on their center pivots. In California, some almond farmers are using computer-assisted drip irrigation systems. An automated surface irrigation uh, for alfalfa is also being considered. More recently, some crop uh, and livestock farms in the U.S. are using solar power irrigation uh, to pump water to cattle and irrigate pasture. Uh, and this is also done in other countries uh, besides the United States. And in growing regions with limited rainfall and decreasing availability of irrigation water, farmers could consider adopting drought-tolerant crops for forage, or choose crops perform relatively well in drier conditions like sunflowers, sorghum, or native grasses. More detailed data and many more observations on crop choice and yields uh, in these regions could contribute to improved management and, in the long run, uh, perhaps higher yielding varieties. On a related note, uh, on-farm use and production of energy, especially renewable energy, will likely uh, be influenced by aggregate big data and big data analytics. Uh, for years now, businesses, including farms, have had net metering opportunities, uh, which allows them to sell electricity that they've generated but haven't used back to the utility. According to recent ERS research, which I'm showing in this chart here, roughly 1.1% of U.S. farms produced renewable energy in 2007, and this more than doubled to 2.7% of farms in 2012. From the chart, we see that solar panels and wind rights leased to others are the two most common forms of on-farm renewable energy production. In 2012, over 36,000 farm businesses and other farms had solar panels. And so in the future, big data could help farmers analyze hourly energy consumption and production, uh, optimization using real-time pricing data could allow farmers to sell on-farm generated energy more profitably. Uh, An analysis of farm generated energy uh, could ultimately help to inform research on aggregated energy. So turning next to nutrient management, it seems likely that big data will also influence our understanding of average fertilizer use. So from ERS data on fertilizer applications, we see that average nitrogen applications on national corn acreage decreased slightly in the early 1990s, increased in the late 1990s, but then it's been fairly stable since. Uh, national phosphorus and potash fertilizer application rates on corn, uh, though, haven't had substantial changes uh, in recent decades. And so if adoption of, for example, you know, variable rate technologies for fertilizer applications were to really take off, this might, uh, we might expect this to reduce fertilizer leaching and runoff. Um, the aggregate effect of this could be improved quality, excuse me, that's just one potential opportunity. But beyond site-specific management, uh, big data could interact with farmers' nutrient management in other ways. So for example, there are new site sensor technologies being developed that allow real-time nutrient analysis of manure. So having a better understanding of the nutrient content of manure could help bring down excess applications and again contribute in the long run uh, perhaps to improve water, water quality. Data from these types of sensors could also help improve nutrient management plans uh, and nutrient reduction strategies from all of those different groups. Of course, it would be difficult to talk about sustainability in ag production without mentioning the increase in consumer demand uh, for foods and crops uh, grown on certified organic cropland in the United States, as well as changes in productions, uh, production practices to meet this demand. So, you know, organic agriculture stresses the importance of soil quality, uh, cycling in nutrients, and plant health. The National Organic Program establishes a process-based standard by which irradiation, biotechnology, sewage sludge, and other synthetic chemicals aren't allowed uh, to be used in production. Uh, we see, though, from, from some recent ERS data, though, between 1992 and 2011, uh, on U.S. cropland, certified organic acreage has been increasing nearly every year. Uh, and also for pasture and rangeland, there's also been exhibiting a, a fairly strong upper trend during this time period. So, again, the exact implications for organic relative to conventional production uh, of big data aren't exactly known at this point, although you know, we do know that organic crop production tends to be on smaller farms in the U.S., 
but agriculture more generally is shifting to larger farms. So in the future, it could be the case that efficiencies from big data could allow uh, small farms to increase their size or scope. Another possibility is that you know, increasing use of data-driven automation could help free up farmers' time uh, for other activities on the farm or off the farm. But apart from organic certification, there's also been increasing interest in recent years for uh, third-party uh, verification of foods and crops produced using sustainable methods or methods uh, deemed to be more environmentally conscious. Uh, you know, and we've seen in recent years uh, proliferation of a lot of food labels uh, designed to signal consumers these types of production practices. Uh, so just to give you one quick example, um, uh, USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service is now offering uh, its Process Verified program uh, for livestock and uh, it has a couple of other uh, certification uh, programs essentially for, for other crops as well. So it is uh, offering these third party uh, certifications. Um, on that point though, several, several retailers uh, are, are allocating shelf space for foods with these labels. And so we might expect them in coming years to continue to look at their data. Uh, by now, they probably have fairly large data sets and consider, continue to analyze them and see how best to source these sustainable type of foods. And some of this could be facilitated by the development of new tools uh, and the new, new field level of sustainability calculators. So as one example, uh, we, have, we know about the field and market groups field print calculator. It allows uh, farmers for a certain field to enter management uh, data in. And then essentially it gives an assessment of soil carbon, soil uh, conservation, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and a host of other uh, sustainable type of dimensions, which I should add uh, uses USDA data as well as data uh, from, other, from other organizations. And again, on a related note, uh, you know, ag, chemical, and equipment companies have also been, uh, in recent years, releasing software platforms that allow farmers to view climate trends, weather forecasts for their fields, and essentially, this type of software can be linked with other uh, software platforms using field level data to ultimately give recommendations uh, for seeds and planting rates. So again, these, these, these types of data-driven software can increase resilience and help farmers to adjusting, uh, in adjusting to changing environments, I should say. On a related point, we're also seeing a number of new smartphone applications or apps being developed. Um, these have a wide variety of uses. Some allow users to share soil and land information, access weather and climate data, while others provide access to nearby cash, cash grain prices, or assist with fertilizer and pesticide calculations. So one final area that I, I want to talk about is uh, climate change. Um, you know, from the perspective of an applied economist, there's several new opportunities afforded by analyses of large climate data sets and large land cover data sets. So I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, NASA's uh, downscale Earth Exchange uh, downscale climate projections offers uh, monthly data on average temperatures and precipitation between 1950 and 2099 at a spatial resolution of about 800 meters uh, across 30 climate models and four scenarios. So taken together, this takes up uh, quite a substantial amount of space. On a related point, uh, the National Agricultural Statistics Service offers its so-called cropland data layer, which provides land cover data, which I'm showing here in this figure, um, based on satellite imagery at a spatial resolution of 30 meters. So this brings me back to a point that we made uh, in the white paper, and that is, uh, with, these increase, with the increase in size and complexity of these data sets, it really allows uh, researchers to develop new methods. And this is something that Keith actually talked a little bit about in terms of machine learning. Uh, so the idea here, well, you know, I, I want to touch on actually something called positive inference. So Keith mentioned the possibility of you know, getting more correlations, which is really what we're, what we're doing a lot with these big data type of techniques, but we also are seeing the development of, of causal inference, which is just a way for economists to use uh, economic data to try to you know, rigorously determine which economic factors cause certain economic outcomes. So I think we'll see in the future, uh, you know, basically research developed along both of these lines, essentially machine learning, but then also uh, machine, learner, machine learning, excuse me, for causal inference. So uh, just in terms of wrapping up, uh, we might expect relatively fast-paced innovations at the intersection of sustainability ag production, um, and big data over the, over the coming years. Some of this innovation could be in the form of new software platforms, smartphone apps, you know, handheld devices, while other innovations could be to existing technologies. More generally, uh, substantial progress could be made in some of the areas that I talked about here today, you know, nutrient management, irrigation, uh, and so on. And if current trends persist, we might expect further advances in third-party sustainability data verification, um, perhaps from a, a a wide array of different market groups. And so to the extent that these new methods and new data sets can be generated and potentially linked with high quality program data, 
uh, from USDA agencies, from ERS, from other organizations, uh, academia, and so on. We would expect this uh, in the future to improve decision making on both sides of that market. So with that, I'll wrap up and uh, thank you again for your time.